Good afternoon. Well, a nice little tiny intimate group. How great is this? I guess there's a bit of excitement going on above us today that might have a... Exactly, they're all a bit distracted out there. Well, maybe they'll have a chance to look at the talk later. What I want to do for the next little bit, little bit is to uh, take you through some of the adaptations that not just polar birds, as the title here implies, but birds that live on the northern oceans or the southern oceans, so the North and South Atlantic, the North and South Pacific as well, because really the adaptations that they need, whether they're in Antarctica or the high Arctic, are pretty much the same adaptations they need if they live out on the sea. So um, if we just think, for example, of the, the high Arctic, so going across Canada, Greenland, Denmark, over to, to uh, Russia and stuff. So this is the north part of Canada here. There's Greenland there, of course. Svalbard, if you ever have a chance to go there on one of these cruises, it's amazing. Uh, it's a whole different type of terrain, than, certainly, than anything you see down here. Uh, you do get polar bears, you do get walruses, lots of different whales and stuff up there as well. And then, of course, as you carry on across the, the top, or you go across to Russia over there, Alaska being here. And then down in the south, southern ocean, so we are now kind of coming up this coast. I'm not exactly sure. I think we're, I think we're somewhere around here. So this is the remnants of that Patagonian ice shield, the various glaciers that we've been seeing. I'm pretty sure we're somewhere just about there. And if we went straight across the continent, Argentina, Falklands are here, South Georgia coming through the South Sea to Antarctica. So the birds that, that inhabit all of this area, and not just here, but all the way across to New Zealand as well, have to undertake the same kind of adaptation if they're going to survive wherever it happens to be. So some of the things that they have to think about is the sun. And you know yourself, if you're out on a sailing boat or if you're out on a beach, how difficult it can be because the sun is not only coming down at you from above, it's also coming up at you from below. So in this case, it's coming up off the water. In the beach case, of course, it's coming up off the sand. So what we do to compensate for that typically is we would wear a hat to try to protect us from suns above, or we would wear sunshade, something like that, or sunscreen to try to protect our skin from the various sun that's coming at us. If you watch the, the, the sports players, football players in particular, they put that black stuff on their face, and that's not just to look tough. It has to do with trying to keep the reflection off of their cheekbone so it doesn't come up into their eye and they can have sort of un, unhindered vision, so to speak. But if you're a bird, you can't really wear sunglasses, you can't really wear makeup, and hats don't seem to stay on their head very well. So what they typically have is that they have sort of um, an area here so just above the eye, the superorbital ridge here, the same as us, and quite often the eye is, is set well back in that, which acts a bit like the peak of a hat might, or a visor might do. And then also they, some, they usually have some kind of a pale cheek that will help reflect the light away from them a little bit. So you'll see that on many of the seabirds. It's almost like the eye is set into the cheek, not sticking out on the edge like it might be on a, I don't know, a robin or something like that. Then we have an issue, or, or the, the, um, the fact about color of the, the birds. If you look at the birds here that live on the ocean, not just the ones that are at the shore, but they're almost all black, gray, and white. And if you kind of think of what it looks like out there, today's a great example, that if you were bright blue, or bright yellow, or bright orange, or bright red, you would really stand out. But if you're gray, black, or white, you become relatively invisible. And I know that when we were in the SOB, uh, it was the first day that we did it, we were looking at penguins, some of us were looking at penguins on the water, and here you have a fairly big bird that was sitting out there, you know, it's, it's about this long, and it gets on the water and it's almost invisible. So you have that, that camouflage in wide open spaces, and it has to do with the fact that they have melanin, which is a pigment, the dark pigment that it causes us to have browner skin, in the summer when we're tanning or if it happens to be your natural color. And then you'll also notice, though, that most of the birds are dark on the back and light on the front. And the reason for that is that if you sit on the water and something looks up at you, they see white, 
and the sky, even though we see it as blue, generally looks white when you look up through the water at it. And if you look down on water, it looks black. So again, sitting on the water flat out with the black back, you're looking down, you become invisible to a predator above you. The other advantage of, of melanin is that it is very resistant to salt and abrasion. It makes the feathers last longer. And remember that you can only get two sets of feathers a year. So you've got to make sure that you do it right. They have to make sure these things last the whole time. That's just sort of summarizing what I just said there. So one of the other things now that you need to do if, if you're going to live out here is, first of all, you're going to spend the majority of your time on the ocean. So somewhere around eight to nine months of your life, you will live on the ocean. The other three or four months, you will live on an island somewhere or a coastal area. And you only go there to breed. So what these birds have to figure out is that if they're not on the ocean and they have to come to land, how are they going to be safe? Remember that they're nesting on the ground because typically where they are, there's no trees, so they can't go higher up to escape the predators. They basically have to either nest on the surface of the ground or under the ground. And so some of the things that they do to try to compensate for that is that these burrows are often very long. They're narrow. They will be, they continue to narrow as they go down. Some of them have dummy side channels out of them. And uh, some of them uh, will go down and then back up again, trying to fool a predator. It's coming in and thinks, wow, this thing's going back to the surface. There can't be anything in there. But this is all tricks that they have. And it's, um, it's something that's called innate knowledge. It's not something they go, I wonder how I could fool the predators. It's something that they just know how to do in order, order to survive. Um, typically, birds that nest in these colonies come in at night. So if you're coming in in broad daylight, unless you're feeding young, which you, which you would, of course, at some point, but when you're not feeding young, if you're just incubating, starting the process, then you will usually come into the colony at night. You'll come in fast, and you'll just kind of just come crashing right into the, to the burrow where you're going to be nesting. It reduces the amount of time that they might be exposed to a predator. So they even do things like they copulate in the, the tunnel itself. So pretty much everything they do happens inside there. They don't sit outside, you know, saying, oh, I'm so tired, the kids are so rotten today. You just kind of, as soon as you leave the colony, or sorry, as soon as you leave the burrow, you leave the colony and you've got to be gone. And that's important because the, your, the predators that you're worried about are the ones that are on the ground. Now they know how to deal with things like skuas and gulls and stuff like that. They're still good predators. But if you get into some of the islands where you have cats or rats or weasels, all these things have been introduced to the various islands, those are devastating to the birds that are there. And they will kill far more than they would ever eat. So these birds have to learn how to adapt to that. And one of the things that you find is that if you're on a predator-free island, and even though you you're innately know you should be doing this, you tend to spend more time outside, if you will, on the porch resting, you know, preening, cleaning up and stuff like that. If you live on a predator um, full island, or island with predators, then you would tend to follow this pattern that I'm describing here where you basically dash in, do what you got to do, get out of there. And then one of the other things, and I think we've all seen this as we travel around, and even if you've ever seen any nature show, is that you do travel in bigger flocks. So you'll find that when the birds come into the colony, they all come in at the same time. So they come rushing in. So even if there was a predator, was a very good hunter, suddenly there's a thousand or ten thousand birds coming in. They're all screaming, and they're coming in, diving into the burrows. So it confuses the predator. It's kind of like watching the lion in the Serengeti, where it sees all the zebras and wildebeest going by, and it's going like, ah, don't know which one of those things I should be attacking. So that's sort of the the, the value of this. So in a case like this, if you were the 10,000 strong coming in, and then you're the one guy over there, or the one guy that's just a bit late, you're likely going to be the one that's going to get picked off as you, as you come into the colony there. Um, birds use a variety of senses to help them to uh, not only survive in a situation like this, but also to feed. So most seabirds, unlike most land birds, have a very, very good sense of smell. So the bird pictured here is a turkey vulture, which is not a seabird, but it is a bird that can live by the sea and does live by the sea. 
So we saw them on the first day that we saw condors. They were feeding along at a, at a sea lion colony, basically and looking for scraps that were there. So turkey vultures are one of the few land birds that have a really super sense of smell. In fact, they find most of their food by, using, by smelling it. So they'd be soaring up ahead, and of course their sense of smell is very different than ours. I mean, we can sort of smell things that are close by, but you know, you know your dog, if you walk your dog, it's picking up scents that are days old, and it just knows everything that's going on around it. Whereas our sense of smell is ridiculously useless when it comes to t trying to help us protect ourselves and even figure out what's going on in the environment most of the time. But things like the turkey vulture will use that as a way to find food. And more importantly, many of the seabirds will be able to find that. So you'll find, for example, that um, this is kind of a weird thing, and I forget the name of, of the, the, the um, not drug, but the uh, chemical that's involved, but when zooplankton, which are the tiny little creatures that are out there, feed on phytoplankton, which are the tiny little plants that are out there, they actually emit an odor that goes into the air. You can imagine how subtle this must be, and then birds like a storm petrel, which is one of the very small seabirds, can actually pick up this little tiny odor from miles and miles away, and then they can come and realize that there's a feeding frenzy going on here of these insects that are out in the middle of the ocean. And that's how you survive when you live in a climate like this. And it's just remarkable that these little tiny, almost invisible insects are under the water, and they just make a bit of a smell, and something way over there, miles and miles over there, picks this up and comes in and has dinner as a result of it. What you also find is that um, if you are a serious bird watcher, you sometimes go out on what is called pelagic bird trips. And that's a trip where you specifically go out and you try to find seabirds and identify them because they're hard. And they're also way at sea, so you have to make a special effort to see them. So what they do is they put out this fishy, gummy slough behind the boat, and it's called chum. And then the, the birds smell that. And so the first ones that smell it, they come in and they start to feed on it, which is what we want as a bird watcher because they're close by. But then suddenly you see that there's a bird from, coming from over there, there's a bird from there, there's a bird from there, there's a bird from there. They're coming from all kinds of different directions. So now you know that they're not just smelling the thing because the, the odor should follow the wind, right? It should always be downwind from you. But these birds are coming from upwind or crosswind or whatever. And so they're now watching the other birds to see what they're doing. They see them diving down, they see the, the frenzy, if you will. So they're using the sight and sound in order to find food when they're out there. One other reason that they use the smell and they use the sound is that when they're coming into their colonies at night to return to the colony to the nest, they have to figure out where the hole is, right? Because this is like a black wall at night, no moon, they're coming in at high speed and they got a target right into that hole. So they call and then the mate who's in the nest calls back and the, between the two of them they figure this thing out. Okay, now just imagine that. You've got 10,000 birds coming in and probably 10,000 birds underground listening and, and they squeak and squawk at each other and then all of a sudden they find the hole. And it's just amazing how they do this whole thing. But it's because their senses are so much more astute than ours. I mean, if we truly had to live as a wild animal, we probably would be long gone from the face of the earth. I mean, we really, it's our brain, you know, and the way that we've adapted that has kept us at the top of the chain, so to speak. But if we only had to rely on our instincts, we wouldn't have a chance out there. We really wouldn't. Um, some things that you need to do now is you need to figure out, I'm going to catch food, okay, which is fine if I happen to be eating the food myself when I'm out there. But what if I need to take the food back to feed my babies? You think, well, that's not such a big deal. We think of our, our robin at home again. I'll use the robin as an example. So the nest is on the porch of your house, and the bird goes to your lawn. And it goes, okay, worm, 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 come back, feed the baby. Worm, 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 come back and forth. Well, these guys might be traveling 100 miles in order to find enough food to feed the baby just for part of a day. So challenge. How do you carry back enough food so that you can make it worthwhile to fly 100 miles out and 100 miles back just to give your kid a morsel? So the way they do it is a couple of things. There's a mention here of a thing called a guler patch. And basically a guler patch is like a, an extra pouch in the throat. 
And what they do is they fill that up last with food. So first what they do is they take whatever they catch and then they start to partially digest it in the stomach. So just a typical bird's stomach, nothing special about it. But as they start to process it, they will themselves start to consume the poorer parts of it. So let's say it's oil-based or fish-based. The, the, the less nutritious parts of that actually get absorbed by them and become part of, part of their dinner, so to speak, because they have to get their strength up as well. But the best part of it, with the highest oils and the most nutrients, are actually dropped down to the bottom of the stomach, and gradually the stomach fills up with all the good stuff. And then when you get to the point beyond that, then you fill up this little throat patch called the guler patch, and now they can take back enough, of, enough food there that might have taken them seven or eight trips, hunting trips, to get back out there and back and forth. So instead of traveling 200 miles round trip, or sorry, they travel 200 miles round trip in that case, instead of traveling, say, 1,400 miles. So they can sort of give this highly nutritious food to the babies, and then, they, then that's a, a good way to do it, a very efficient way to do it. One of the other things, of course, that they have to deal with is salt. And um, in this picture here, if you look at it, this is a giant petrel. And if you look on the beak here, you see, so there's the beak, typical beak, and there's this funny tube on the top of the head, and there's actually a hole in the end of it here. And if you look carefully right there, it looks like there's a drop of water. It's actually pure saline that's there. So when you live on the ocean, you're constantly ingesting salt from the spray, from the food that you eat, from sticking your head in the water to clean yourself or grab the food. So you have to get rid of that. So in the brain area, somewhere in the frontal lobe here, there are glands that are in there. And the purpose of them is to process the salt in the system and then get it out of the body. So basically process it and then it moves it down through this duct on the, the beak here. If I could reach that from here or not. So it would process it up in here somewhere and it moves it down here, it runs across the top of the beak and basically just drips off into the, the environment around it. So if you do watch these birds closely, pretty much all the seabirds deal with salt in exactly that way. And then um, the food that they have is kind of grotesque looking, if you imagine, because as I said before, it's partially processed, it's making it better, easier for them to carry the best food back with them, but then you gotta feed the babies. So what these guys do, typically, most of them, is that they regurgitate the food. Now, some of you have been to Antarctica, I know you've told me before, so you've probably seen the penguins feeding the babies, and you'll, you'll know that it's not just the parent shows up and she, he, she or he immediately goes, come on kids, it's time for dinner. They kind of stand around. And you kind of think, what's going on here? Like they went into all this trouble to go out and get some food. They just swam 10 miles out there to catch some krill and bring it back. And then you're just standing around, what's going on? And then the baby walks up to them and it kind of whacks them in the side of the head. Okay, like a teenager talking to you guys. So, but they kind of whack the beak a little bit. And then when the parent starts to react and open the mouth, then they kind of force their beak inside the mouth of the parent. And what they're doing is they're st stimulating the parent to regurgitate the food. So it's kind of a whole ritual that seems sort of subtle to us, but it's really important ritual for the parent to be stimulated to feed the baby. And a part of it is that the parent is trying also to make sure this is the right kid. Okay, because they do use the sound. They, it's hard to, rec I mean, we don't see the differences. You hear like a Gen 2 penguin or Magellanic that we've seen. I don't know, to me, they kind of sound the same. But, but they recognize each other. And so there's that, that probing, the prodding, if you will, to get them stimulated. But also at the same time, they're confirming this is the right kid. Because you can't afford to waste the food on somebody else's baby penguin or whatever it happens to be. Because it's too hard to, for food to come by, to come by food. In here, um, we have a bird called a storm petrel, a Wilson storm petrel. So, so that's the one that I just mentioned, the one that kind of can zoom around uh, in the ocean, follow these little tiny invertebrate smells that are miles away and hone in on them. So one of the things that they like to do, well not like, the one thing that they do is if you, so these are the storm petrels up top. So the three there, the one in the top corner, and this guy here. These are all storm petrels, and they call them sea swallows, even though they're not a swallow, but they kind of fly like a swallow does. And it's a little hard to see, and I really, it's hard with the screen here, but I think if this, if this was perfect light, 
that bird there that has sort of the triangle hanging off the bottom of his foot, that's really just the toes on his foot that are spread wide, but they're bright yellow. The webbing between the toes are bright yellow on this and many of the other types of storm petrels around the world. And the reason that they're yellow is because yellow is a very uncommon color here. So if you can have an advantage to, to pique the curiosity of prey, then you're going to get more food. So what they do is they, so we'll, you, we'll presume you can see that this is actually yellow, which it is, and then they dangle it in the water, to sort of dabble in the top of the water, and then the little invertebrates or little fish come up and go like, what is this up here? There's water moving, and there's this cute little yellow thing up there, and then your dinner. So the, so the um, storm petrel just stays fluttering above the water, reaches down, grabs the prey, carries on and does it again. These guys down here are a different type of bird, and they're feeding a different way. So these are pintados or cape petrels. So if you went to Antarctica, you would have seen those. You won't see them up here, but they do go all the way across the southern ocean over towards um, Tasmania, New Zealand. You'll see them through there, and then, of course, the other side of Antarctica as well. But instead of flying and dangling their feet, what they do is they sit in the water, and you can kind of envision any of these, like their head is down, and they're kind of poking in the water to see what's around down there, and sometimes they'll actually put their head under and have a peek. So they're sort of dabbling on the surface, if you will, looking for tidbits. Um, they will scavenge on a carcass, so they're quite happy to do that. So we kind of think of all these things as being pure hunters, but if you only rely on killing something uh, and you overlook perfectly good food that's already dead, then it's kind of a disadvantage to you. So they've learned um, that that's an important way to feed as well. And then for food, in the southern hemisphere, what you have primarily is this little guy up here, krill. So there's a bunch of different species of krill here. Um, the most common one is about two inches long, but they can be up to six inches depending on the species that are out there. Um, just about everything in, this, in the sub-Antarctic waters and the Antarctic waters feeds on this. Pretty much everything coming up this coast, the bottom part of the coast, at some point will feed on them as well. The problem for wildlife is that we have, to, have decided that they might be a good food source for us. But we don't know is how much should we leave for the whales and the penguins. So that's the challenge when we get into the krill fishery for people because they, even though we know the biology of the whales and seals and all the other seabirds, we're not quite sure how much food should be left for them so we can harvest for ourselves. And I guess in time, what will likely happen is you'll start to get krill farms if, if the trend continues where they would actually, and that's, I know people don't like the fish farms and stuff like that, but you know what? Those are actually bred for feeding us as opposed to taking them out of the environment or something else has to suffer or, or go without so that we can have it. So it is a kind of, a, I know it's a tricky balance, but, but sometimes it may not be so bad to consider that as an alternative. And then when you get up into the northern seas, you get into things like the little sea, sea uh, um, sorry, uh, little eely things. Let's call them little eely things. Okay, technical word. Ah, I forget the name. Sorry, it's just, just escaping me for a second there. Um, so you, sorry? Is it? I don't know. I don't know that word. Okay, let's call it that. Let's call them little Ely Elver things. All right. Okay, got it. See how adaptive I am, how quick I am with just picking up on that? I know, I know. It's amazing, isn't it? That's why I'm up here. <laughs> there, are, uh, there are little sand lance as well. There's some of the other names. A couple of names starting to come back to me slowly. I'll call you all about 3 o'clock tomorrow morning with the rest of the names. Okay, so anyways, around the oceans, there's always a food source out there. And it comes in different sizes, and it comes at different depths. So one of the other things that these birds do, depending where they are, and how they catch the food, is that they will use different foods to, to supply their own particular needs. So for example, if you were in a northern lake in, in say, North, North America, you would have a, a loon, or if you're in Europe, you have a diver, which is the same bird. And basically, they will look for food below the surface at varying depths, and they will dive down, chase it around until they catch it, and then, of course, they're done. 
whereas you have other birds that might uh, just dive from the air like an osprey or a, or a kingfisher, see some fish near the surface, dive in and grab it. Or you might have other ones that just will hunt from the, from the sitting on the surface and sort of picking away to see what they can find. Same thing happens out in the ocean. They feed in different ways, as I mentioned, with the, the pintados and with the, the storm petrels. They will do that, and you'll find that things like albatrosses and giant petrels will dive, but only down to two to three meters. So, so say six to eight feet, six to nine feet, they can go down, but they won't go any further than that. But a penguin might go down 100 meters, 300 feet or more to catch its meal. So what you're doing is you're taking a finite food resource at different levels in the water column. And then different birds are exploiting those in different ways, trying to get at them. And one of the things that you do find with something like a Gen 2 penguin, which is sort of the predominant one and becoming the predominant one in Antarctica, is that um, if food is scarce, the females feed at a different level than the males do. They feel much, feed much closer to the surface. The males will dive past perfectly good food leaving it for the females and take the prey that's down lower than that. So even within that, there's some evolution that's going on, adaptability, and that's pretty recent science that's showing that to be the case. So for me, what that means is that, um, you know, as a, as a species evolves, the more adaptable you are, the more likely you are to succeed. So even with climate and all the impacts of that, the Gen 2 penguin's probably going to come out on top unless things change pretty dramatically as time goes by. Now the last little bullet there, bycatch has to do primarily with the fishing industry. So bycatch is simply those things that you catch as a, as a fishing operation that you don't want. So it used to be that they would throw tons and tons and tons of stuff away, and now they try to make use of those things as opposed to wasting them. The, the disadvantage for wildlife is that more is being taken out of the environment and a lot of that would have been put back as waste before for something to eat. So it's kind of a, I don't know if it's good or bad, but a lot of birds will, will follow fishing vessels just because they know they're going to get a free meal out of it. If I do another talk on long line fishing, you'll find out why that's a bad idea. You'll have to come back for that one. Um, we have one bird down there that actually comes into the Falkland Islands and some of the other sub-Antarctic islands and southern South America called a sheath bill. So here's a picture of the sheath bill here. Um, we did see one sheath bill in, um, or so one little flock of four of them in Ushuaia at the very beginning of the trip, but since then we haven't seen any and I'm not surprised because they really shouldn't be coming very far up this coast. They're more right across the bottom of, of the world. There's two species in the world, the one here, snowy, and the one called black-billed on the other side, the African-Australian side of the world. But what they are is sort of superb um, opportunistic uh, players, predators, sorry. I think my next slide shows, you know, so here's some of the stuff that they eat. And I mean, most of it sounds kind of normal, kind of stuff you might want to have, have you know, some eggs, chickens, maybe a little poop for dinner. I don't know, nasal mucus sounds kind of, kind of disgusting, doesn't it? But what they're doing is they're taking advantage of all of the food resources that might be available, particularly in a seabird or, or a sea lion or seal colony. And so, for example, I have watched them grab the placenta of a seal being born and, as, and rip it out of the female and basically eat it. Now, it doesn't hurt the female. It doesn't hurt the baby. But it's like you're right there, you know this is happening, and these things are so clever and so in tune with what's going on around them that they don't even have to think about, I wonder if that's food. They know that it's food. And they will go after feathers, for example, because that'll give them calcium. That's kind of hard to come by down here. The nasal mucus, I'm not really sure what you get out of that, but it is something, maybe it's not really that they're eating that so much, but maybe there are some parasites in the nostrils of the various seals or something that are here, and they're actually going in there, but I know the seals don't like it. So usually if you have a predator-prey uh, relationship where they're coming in to take parasites off of you, usually the, the, the uh, host is tolerant, but the seals do not like this at all. They're sneezing and snorting at the, these other guys. And then on the other side is more typical stuff that they might um, 
but they may eat. So if they're in an area where there's more food, they will turn to insects and things like that. They'll actually pick around garbage cans if they're in an urban center as well. And then the one that's really interesting is the seal's milk at the top there. They will actually force their beak onto the nipple of a seal who's trying to suckle its baby, trying to get the milk before the baby can get it. And again, I've seen them do that. So it's, uh, they're, uh, they're really, really neat. Now, the one thing that's, that's even more, more neat about them, or neater, is that uh, they are the only bird in Antarctica that can't swim. Every other species of bird has webbed feet and can swim. This is the only bird that goes down there, a species of bird, that can't swim. So the disadvantage, of course, is you can't hunt on the ocean. You've got to find all your food on land, first of all. And secondly, uh, if something happened to the land, let's say you, you know, I don't know, whatever happened, that iced over or whatever, they'd have to either stand on the ice or at the end of the season when all the food's gone, they're going to have to fly back to the mainland, back to South America or somewhere else. So they do this long flight both ways at the start and end of the season as well. Then we have, um, okay, I, mean, I think I might have covered this, but I'll just see if there's anything different here. So we just have some different ways that birds will catch the fish as they're doing here. So, um, oh, sorry, come back, come back. Darn it. Oh, I'll go the other way back. Well, now I've, caught, I've caused chaos here. Now, there we go, okay. So I mentioned pursuit swimming, which simply means that you look around and you dive and you chase something through the water. Okay, pretty simple. Or you have the plunge diving, which is like the gannets that are shown here, sort of from high on air, on, on above, they dive into the water and they, and they actually have spotted the prey. So it's not like they're just diving down and hoping they find something. They see the prey from up there, dive down and get it. They dabble, which is the one I mentioned, they're picking on the surface like the pintado was doing there. And then stealing, so the kleptoparasitism. And that is something that a lot of birds do, particularly the gulls. And I think I mentioned the frigate bird yesterday as one that steals its food from, from another bird. And you will see this quite often. You'll see like a gull carrying a fish or something like that. And then every other gull in the neighborhood is chasing it around and they're wheeling, hoping that the first bird drops it and then something will, will break off the chase, run down and grab that. Then everybody chases it for a while until they can finally swallow the food. So that's a very, very common technique about catching food down here. And once you catch your food, how do you hang on to it? Because remember that almost everything here is slippery. So now these things have to figure out, what do I do? So um, we talk about some of the things here uh, that many of them have a long hooked bill. So up on the right there is one of the shags. There's the imperial shag, blue-eyed shag that we've encountered a few times here. And what they have typically is um, sort of a beak that has very rough ed edges along its length, and they'll have a hook at the end. And the purpose of the hook, in this case with the shag, is to be able to grab and hang on to, like a little pair of vice grips, hang on to the fish. And then once it gets it under control, then it, these little ridges along the side of the beak will hold it steady until they can maneuver it around so that it's head first, and then they can swallow it, take it down that way. Um, some birds, well, we don't see too much here, but down a little bit further south, birds called prions, they have little fringes on the side of their beak. And I think you've heard about whales with their baleen plates and how they, you know, they have these funny things that hang down inside their mouth. And then when they catch the prey, they basically open their mouth, take water, take prey, then they force the water back out and these little, this little curtain of filaments traps the prey behind it, then they swallow those and then they get dinner and over and over. Well, there are birds that do a very similar thing as well, and they're called prions. So they have these little fringes inside their mouth that basically trap the good food inside there and, and, and filter the water out. Because part of the problem is even though the water wouldn't hurt them if they swallowed it, if they fill up too much on water, they've got to take time to process it and get it out. So it's better to only ingest what you actually intend to use as part of this. We have other birds like the skua at the bottom there, Big, heavy beaks, very powerful, and they're designed to rip flesh apart on a, on a carcass or even a baby penguin that's alive. They're designed to be able to grab an egg, carry it off, and crush that egg so they can get at the contents of it. So you have that whole thing where it's really, really important to have a very strong beak because not everything comes easy down here. So if you have a seal that's dead and you want to eat it, you've got to break through that outer skin if you will, and they're tough, they're designed you know, not to just fall apart. 
Um, so you break that apart so you can get at the nutritious innards of it. And you'll see the birds sort of ripping away, the, you know, both the skuas and the giant petrels will be ripping away at that until they get a hole big enough that they can literally put their whole head inside and start to eat the, the warm, juicy innards that, that, that's coming out of it. And uh, let's see here. So here's an example of a series of shots. Now, I didn't take this particular series of pictures. A friend of mine did. But just to show you a shag, look at the size of the fish. And this was done, um, this was taken, I think, right in Ushuaia, if I'm not, or maybe Falklands, sorry, the Falklands. But look at the size of the fish that that bird has taken down. And you wonder, when you look at its skinny little neck, it's like, how does it even do that? You know, like it's like the fish is wider than the neck is here. And you'll also notice, of course, that it, it's been moving it around enough so they can get all of the fins on the side under control. Because if they get those fins going the wrong way and jamming in their throat, they're going to die. Simple as that. There's no way to get it out. Uh, it's like getting a fish hook caught in you and trying to just rip it out. It's, it doesn't work that way at all. But this is an actual sequence of photos uh, of a single bird that my friend took. And it was successful getting this, this thing down. And like, I don't even know. It's just amazing that it would even fit in the stomach of the bird. So it was just, uh, I think this is one of those macho birds or something. Um, so this is a giant petrel. This is what you look like on a bad day. Um, this is the same species that we saw flying around the harbor. Now this happens to be an adult. The ones we saw at the harbor in Ushuaia, and for most of the journey here, have actually been the immature birds. I'm not sure where the adults have gone, but they might have gone farther out to sea. But along the coast so far, we've seen sort of black-looking birds that are this species here. So what's happened with this particular one was it was feeding on a dead seal carcass, and it's pretty hard to tell, but I think you can see that it looks like there's some reddish tinges around the head there. Well, you can pretty much guess what that's from, all right? And then, of course, look at what it's standing on and where it's trying to feed. So they get really, really dirty. And what the important part of this, though, for that is, is not so much getting dirty, but it's getting clean. And it's not because they need to be tidy, but they need to protect the feathers. Remember, come back to that. Two sets of feathers a year. You can't have them full of mud and then getting yourself wet, not being insulated against the elements. You've got to have the feathers dry. They've got to be clean. So after they go through this frenzy of feeding, which might take several hours, then they're going to go into the ocean and they're going to bathe and they're going to come out and they're going to be the proper color and they're going to be pretty darn clean. And if, again, if you've been to Antarctica, you've experienced the penguins going in the water and they go in, they're all covered in poop, you know, front to back, and they come in and then they clean themselves off, they come to the shore, they preen, get the feathers all going the right direction to make sure that all the little air that they can trap in there is trapped properly so that they can control the temperature of the body. So very, very important adaptation that all these birds, they know how to do. The one thing that's interesting about uh, the, the snowy sheath bill is that they will eat their neighbor's kids as happily as as they mucus out of a, sneals, a seal's nose. So they, when they go bathing, they usually go off together. So it kind of means that nobody's going to eat the kids. And I don't know quite how they figure it out. And, and I've seen it, but I'm not sure that I've seen it, if you know what I mean, because it's not obvious. It's not like, oops, 2 o'clock, it's bathing time. Let's get all the sheath bills off the beach and pop down to the little sauna and have a bath. But I have seen them fly off together and start to clean. So I think there's some validity in that, that argument, but I haven't read a paper on it yet. So one of the other things now that um, if you ever watched uh, March of the Penguins, you saw the impact on the emperor penguins of how cold it was and, and how what terrible, terrible conditions. And what do they do to keep warm? Well, basically, they have to rely on themselves and their neighbors. So in that particular case, and if you listen carefully, you, you sort of had what's called a crash. And a crush is basically a whole bunch of animals of the same species getting together and using the, the companionship for many different purposes. One of those is to keep warm. So in the case of those emperor penguins, they would slowly circle towards the middle, and then the middle ones would circle the way out so that you were always getting closer to or farther from the heat source. Because in the middle of that, that little blob of birds, the temperature might be 20 degrees Celsius, so like 30 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever that happens to work out to. 
Um, so really significant temperature difference between the center of that and the birds on the outer edge. So if you just left the birds out there, they would probably would die off. And the, only the ones in the middle would be able to survive. But they've got this bizarre relationship where they just don't really force the way in and out. They just kind of go slowly in a circle until they get to the outside, then they start to come back in, in again as well. So it's really kind of a fascinating way for them to, to deal with that. Am I in trouble on time? Oh, okay, oh, sorry. Just thinking that this was the, 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 <laughs> the clock crew coming in and say, hurry up. Um, one of the other things that you learn from a crash, uh, watching birds in a crash, is that in some species, like the king penguin in particular, it's a way for the baby or the young penguins to learn how to be a good parent. So particularly the king penguin, because they take about 18 months to go through their cycle from being an egg to a breeding adult. So it's quite a long time, a year and a half is pretty abnormal in a harsh climate for them. But they're quite self-sufficient after about six or seven or eight months. Uh, they can't fish or hunt yet, but they start to learn that they, they learn what a predator is. So for example, the skuas would be coming in there trying to kill them, or the giant petrels might come in and try to take them. So they learn to watch them. They learn how they hunt. They learn how to recognize the parents coming in. They watch the parents going out. What do they do? You know, they see that they're sort of not jumping on top of a sea lion on their way out. They kind of make sure that they, they safely go around the safe end of a sea lion. Uh, on their way out of the place, or an elephant seal, sorry, on their way out of it, and they watch how they bathe. So they learn a lot about being an adult by just watching, whereas in most other penguin species, it's kind of like, I'm gonna give you some food, you know, at, not, at nine or 10 months, you're on your own, we'll take you to the water, we'll give you about a half a day lesson, and, and away you go. But with some species, like, like the king penguin and the emperor penguin in particular, they have a great opportunity to learn how to be better parents. And what you find is their success rate on breeding and survival is actually quite high as a result of that. And then we have kleptoparasitism, my favorite. So I, I mentioned that already. Um, so there are different techniques in the north and south um, where they do that. And I think in the north, the most aggressive thing that I've ever heard is of some of these skuas in particular will actually grab another bird in the air and sort of grab its wing and try to shake it. Whereas typically with something like a frigate bird or even a skua down here, they tend to harass it by maybe bumping into it or just coming close and trying to distract it. But uh, there are some examples, uh, documented examples in the north where they really aggressively grab the bird and that to me is it's a little scary. Well, the bottom thing there is um, interesting because in the north, the skua, or the Jaeger, as we call it in North America, has, uh, most of those species we have in northern Canada, for example, have two different color morphs. And a color morph simply means um, that, it, that in many of them they're pale colored, in some they're dark colored, but it's the same species, even though they don't look the same. And what they found through studies was the ones that were the dark morph had better success at hunting than the ones that were the light morph. And the reason they did that was like a really weird thing. It wasn't intuitive at all. But many of the predators will, when they're going into the colonies in, in the north, for example, won't fly in and make a big rush and you know, get everybody excited. They'll kind of sort of land off to the edge and just kind of walk around, nothing to see here, folks. You know, just kind of walk around looking for something that's not paying attention. And then typically, if you're a young bird of any color morph, you're more likely to walk around a colony just because you're not really sure of what you're doing yet. You're kind of trying to learn to figure the whole thing out. So what they were finding was that the adult dark morph birds nonchalantly walked in. The prey was thinking, I guess those are young birds. And they were kind of ignoring them a little bit. So that, that split second of distraction is all that it needs. So they were finding that these dark birds, adults, that looked like young light ones we're having good success. So it's kind of interesting how, how these bizarre behaviors can arise in some of these things. And the streamers, this is another one here. Um, very quick, a lot of writing there, but the gist of this is that with our northern skuas or Jaegers, uh, the three that are in Canada all have long tails, whereas the rest of the world, they all have short tails. But in North America, the ones that we have, 
The tail is part of the breeding cycle. And now, um, what they would fi did find very simply, it's kind of like with any bird that has, you know, plumes or something like that, they, the bigger the better. And quite often, once they finish with the breeding cycle, they'll either break off or tear out some of those unnecessary feathers because they cause drag. And the reason that a school it cares if it causes drag is that because most of its prey capture is done by speed, even though I said they do walk. But once they, once they get past that stage, if they're hunting, when everything is out of the colony, they gotta catch it. So anything that's dangling down and, and is useless to them, they'll actually break off. So you'll find that when these, many of these birds get down to the south on their way through migration, the feather stubs will be there or parts of the tail, but they'll be damaged quite often because they've been trying to get rid of them to streamline themselves as much as possible. They're all very powerful, very strong flyers, and it's really quite, quite exciting to watch the skuas um, when, you, when you have a chance. Like in Ontario, where I live, in the fall, let's say starting in August through till about uh, middle of October, you can watch these skuas come down, chasing the gulls and ducks around on Lake Ontario, where I live. And you can always tell they are, even though they kind of look gull-like from a distance, they fly better, and they're just much stronger, and it's really, really exciting to watch them. And then, um, again, particularly in areas where nesting material might be hard to come by, and that's very often the case in just about all of the subantarctic or the Antarctic islands, because there's not a lot of, uh, well, it's hard to get the bark off these tiny trees that are only two inches tall. You know, you might be able to get some lichens off some areas, but many of the areas don't have any vegetation at all. So quite often what they'll do, particularly in Antarctica, is they'll have nests that are made out of rocks. And then um, the, you'll see them, of course, if you've been there, you'll have seen this yourself, it's pretty obvious. What the distance between those two nests, or in a nest of two different pairs, is just a tiny bit longer than what they could reach. So if I'm sitting on a nest here, how far can I reach? I can reach to there. That one's on a nest there, it can reach here. There's about that much space. So that way you can, you can you know, warn the neighbor but not risk getting hurt, getting a beak in the eye and losing your vision or something. So these are all nicely spaced out there. But what you do find is that uh, there's a lot of theft because the perfect little rocks, and they've, they've actually done enough studies on this, they know how big a perfect little rock is. It's about an inch long by about three quarters of an inch wide. So what you find is they're always stealing the rocks. So you'll watch a bird over here and it's kind of looking at the nest over there where the where mum has gone, kind of sneaks over, grabs a thing. As soon as its bum's off the ground, this one steals a, a, a rock from him. And they did a study, and I forget just the exact numbers that were there, but they put out a bunch of piles of rocks one evening and they, and they color coded them. So they painted some white and green and red and whatever to see what happened. By the morning, they, all the rocks were gone and they were all over the colony. So these birds had figured this whole thing out, and, but they, now they know exactly where each rock went and how far, they didn't know how many steps it took to get there, but they do know that these rocks were gone. So it really reinforced this whole thing about just how important it was for them to keep looking for new material because it was a finite resource for them. So that was pretty neat. And then the last thing about don't eat the neighbors, um, that, that's, I mean, all these things, except for the penguins, aren't trying to eat their neighbors, but the sheath bill will, the giant petrel will, the kelp gull will, the, uh, any, any of the schools will eat their neighbors as well. So it's not a safe place because your enemy lives right with you. They nest with you, they're there. 24-7 the whole time that you're there. And then we have other things about other types of nests. Um, most of the nests are very primitive all through all of the species that the nest in these, as I mentioned before, some of them nest in the burrows, some of them nest on the ground. This particular thing, the, the uh, um, Antarctic tern pictured there, that's what its egg looks like. So pretty simple. This is the nest. I mean, that's as, as fancy as the nest gets. Now the one thing that you need to be aware is that if we have our robin back home again, they can tolerate a range of temperatures where if the bird isn't, if the parent isn't sitting on the egg, the egg will still survive. You saw the march of the penguins, they told you they have about 30 seconds. So if that egg is dropped off the foot of that parent and just lays on the ice, it'll freeze within about 30 seconds. At some, not, not for the whole breeding season, but for part of the breeding season. So now here, what do you do? because you can't protect that egg every minute of every day. You have to go off and feed yourself and stuff like that. So these eggs down there typically are much more tolerant than any of the eggs that we have at home. 
so they can last, I'm not freezing, but they can last quite cold temperatures for 15, 20 minutes, no problem at all, which is enough time for the parent to go out and get a snack and come back and, and come back and, and finish incubating with the egg. So they're quite tolerant of that in many, many species that are down there. And then we have this um, other issue of, of competition. So I mentioned before with the Gen 2 penguin that sometimes what will happen is the, uh, the, the male will feed at deeper, deeper levels than the other. But even in the nesting cycle here, you have uh, this patricide where, where sometimes, or siblicide, which is uh, where one of the siblings will actually kill the other one. So you, usually the eggs are laid at least a day apart. And in most species in the, in the polar regions, they start to incubate the egg as soon as it's laid, partly to make sure that it doesn't freeze, but partly to make sure that one of the birds is stronger than the other. So that one day doesn't sound like a big deal, but it can be the difference of that, you know, a, a, you know half an inch, quarter of an inch greater reach so you can get your beak to the parent first and get the first of the food there. So that can be really, really important. And then if food is really scarce, sometimes the one little penguin or the one whatever it happens to be will kill the other one just to ensure survival. And I know it sounds awful, but it is, it is a, a fact of nature. If food is plentiful, that, that impulse isn't there. And most of the time you'll see that the penguins, for example, using that, will have both of the babies. But if food's scarce, and we'll probably see this more and more as climate change continues to impact and move the food sources away from the colonies, you'll probably find that the breeding cycle will still continue for many of the species, but they won't have as much success because there'll be more of the second bird dying. Sometimes you'll find in some species, like the, like the uh, chinstrap penguin, that the first egg is bigger than the second egg. So again, it's odd that they could, you know, that they do this physically. You don't have to think about it. which egg is this, should I make it bigger or smaller? It's just the way the system works. So being bigger means that you're likely going to be born slightly heavier, slightly stronger, and then you have that extra day advantage. So once again, you're the big brother and you might just be the one that survives as you come out the other end of this whole thing. Asynchronous uh, incubation simply means that you start incubating the day it's laid. So this egg's laid, it gets an extra day of incubation, which means it hatches the day earlier than the other one does as well. And then we have the issue of trying to keep warm or cool. The biggest problem with these guys is not so much keeping warm, but it's keeping cool. So we, pardon me, sorry, um, we, um, we ourselves will turn the air conditioner on, we'll turn the heat on, we'll put a blanket over our lap, we'll take a coat on, take a coat off. So we can do that. But if we were out there naked in the woods trying to adapt to the climate, we don't really have the resources within ourselves to do much, you know, to try, except for sweating or, or, or shaking, trying to keep ourselves warm, but we're really not very good at it. But these other these birds and the mammals all have a good way of doing it. So there is one uh, technique called thigma, thigmatosis. Oh, sorry. Oh, God, I'm going to blow this one. Thigmatosis, which is basically hugging. So when you see pictures of, of elephant seals, for example, not the males that are always fighting, but all the females are all snuggled together in a ball. And what they're doing is they're spooning, basically sharing the body heat between them. Um, but in birds, it's kind of hard to do that. So they do the crush thing that I mentioned before, but they also do this little weird thing over here, not so much the fact that its head is missing, but the fact that its feet are sticking up in the air. This particular king penguin, it actually has a head, it's just thrown back over its, its back. And, um, and it, they, they do this thermoregulation in one of two ways. One is to put the feet up so that they're facing into the wind. So in this particular case, this bird was facing to the northwest because it was in South Georgia, and the winds came down from the northwest towards it there. So it puts its feet up so that the cool air can blow across the bottom of the feet, and then it pumps more blood to the feet so the blood can be cooled and then, then cool off the core of the bird. The same thing is if, if they're, um, another way that they do it is more effective, is to lift the wings. And if you've ever watched penguins in a colony, uh, you'll see that if the underwing is white, it means that their temperature is okay. If it's pink, it means they're too hot. So they basically lift their little wings up, they pump the blood to it, and, the, and then the blood comes along the surface and the wind hits the undersurface of the wing, cooling it off. So this is all called thermoregulation. 
So they can't pant like a dog, they can't sweat. They basically have to use that kind of a technique in order to control the temperatures around them. And then flying is another issue, of course, and I'm, I'm going to watch my time here a little bit. But um, just very, very briefly, is most of the seabirds, as you've noticed, if you watched any of the albatrosses we've seen so far, is they never seem to flap. And, and in the most simple terms, what they're doing is called dynamic flying. So if you envision using gravity, crosswinds, and differential and air pressure, sort of combining all of that in your head to try to, how do I fly without moving my wings? So you start up here, for example, and you've maybe got the wind as a crosswind. So if you're a sailor, you might understand that. It gives you a bit of speed. You start to come down using gravity and the crosswind. You get down just to the surface of the water. The pressure of, of the air pressure down there is usually lower right above the surface of the water. So you actually accelerate through that. You snap out the other side and then you pull back up and then you go to stall speed like an airplane would. And you come around and you do it again. So it's kind of like a, not quite like a figure eight, but it's kind of like that. And they're using those various currents and, and crosswinds and stuff in order to allow them to do that. By doing that, they can literally fly for days without flapping. And I remember watching a, a, a wandering albatross following our ship and we were doing 14 knots, so about 16 miles an hour. And this bird passed us like we were stopped and it didn't flap its wings once. That's how effective they are, and it was just amazing when you think about it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, their sense of finding their way home has to be profound. And there's just some facts at the bottom, and these are true. This was a study that was done where they took Manx Shearwaters and they took them far, far away from where they ever belong. They took them to places they never should go, and they wanted to see if they could get home again. So here's some of the things you have there. So from Scotland, they've traveled 1,400 kilometers and it took them 12 days to get back to the colony. Only 12 days to go 1,400 kilometers. That's like almost just under 1,000 miles, 900 miles that they did that. From Boston, 13 days to go 3,000 miles. Venice, 13 days to go, uh, that'd be about 4,000 miles, give or take. Australia, 14 months to go 16,000 kilometers. That's over 10,000 miles. So that one's a bit slow, but still not bad, pretty impressive. So this is kind of the, the homing ability that they have. And what they're doing is they're using magnetic forces on the earth, they're using the sun, they're using the stars, they're using knowledge of wind, and they're basically able to find their way back. And then when they get closer, they're actually using the smell of the ocean and the smell of the colony to get them right back to where they started. So that's really important because not so much when we interfere and try to set them free, but it's more important when they wander in the off season like they do now. And the birds in New Zealand might be on our doorstep tomorrow. They got to get back to New Zealand next spring in order to raise their young there. So it's really, really profound the way they do that. I'm going to zoom through that. And then sometimes if you're a penguin, of course, if you can't fly, you have to swim, you have to toboggan. There's different ways for you to get around, so. And... So useless facts, I like those, okay. It takes a lot of, a lot of energy to, to grow feathers, by the way. It takes a lot of energy to incubate an egg. Okay, I'm going to skip over that. And then this is an odd one. This is um, two species that are here. The one on the left is a skua, and they have in the bend of their wing, they have an extra claw that they don't use for any other purpose other than defense. And it's called, it's called a carpal spur. You can't really see it in the picture here. And you can't see it because it's really hard to see. But it would be right about in here. And it's a little spur that they have there, an actual, actual toenail type thing. And then if a predator gets too close, they can turn their wing down and they can lash with that because it's, there's no other fingers, if you will, on the wings. So they have to have some kind of a defense. There's not many birds in the world that have that, but both of these species do. And then something I won't go some of the times are perfect. So for example, we have a, a, a king penguin on the left, and this isn't a dirty bird here. This happens to be the melanin in it. Just was crazy on the bird. So sometimes you get this very dark morph, and sometimes you get this other bizarre thing called leukism, where the, the browns really aren't there, and they're sort of diminished, and the, the lighter colors take over from those. 
I think I'm going to skip that one and just go to this. There's the perfect bird then. So once you figure all this stuff out about flying and feeding and sleeping and nesting and avoiding predators, you come up with a bird like this, which I'll use the, the sheathbill's head to typify that bird that understands that I live in a, a, a marine climate. I can't swim, but I'm going to be really great at it, and I'm going to eat anything. We have the body of a skua, gives you the idea of the top predator. You got the feet of a ducky thing, so you know they can swim in this brain thing. And then you've got the soaring ability of an albatross's wings. So that's sort of introduction to what it's really like out there if you're a bird. Uh, a couple of minutes for questions if you want. Okay, bye. Thank you.